please don't call me Dr. Chowdhury, call me Akshay. I know your email is seated, but like, very informal. Oh, okay, okay, okay. Yeah. I'll, I'll stick to that. Yeah. Okay. Okay. So, all right. So, hello and welcome everyone to who's ever listening to this particular podcast on YouTube, Apple, Google, Spotify or any other platforms. I am Jay Shah and I invite machine learning engineers, researchers, entrepreneurs, professors to talk more about the current work insights and about the journey in getting started with it. And for this particular podcast, we have Akshay, who is an assistant professor at Stanford University in the radiology department. He has a strong background in bioengineering with a bachelor's from University of California, San Diego and a PhD from Stanford, followed by a postdoctoral experience in radiology at Stanford. So, uh, Akshay, welcome to this podcast and um, thanks for being here. Yeah, absolutely. Thanks for having me here, Jay. Looking forward to chatting a little bit more about healthcare and machine learning. All right. Um, so before we get started into the whole uh, technical jargons, uh, can you tell us a bit about your current research interests and the projects that you are currently working with to get a better overview of what you are um, working with? Yeah, absolutely. So like you mentioned, uh, I work in a radiology department at Stanford. So a lot of my research is really guided by clinical questions uh, and ways in which we can improve patient care at the end of the day. My specific background uh, is in engineering. So I like to think about things like signal processing, image acquisition, image reconstruction. And within the whole concept of machine learning in healthcare, I tend to focus more on the, on the medical imaging aspects. And I feel like a lot of medical imaging research relies on what can we do with an image once we have it? So trying to build classification models, trying to build segmentation models on top of it. But what I also like to focus on is how do we acquire that image in the first place? For example, with things like magnetic resonance imaging, for example, um, if, if, we go, uh, if we go to the clinic, it might take anywhere from 30 minutes to 40 minutes to get a routine MRI scan done. That's not the worst thing in the world, but that means that we limit how many patients we can scan per day. Uh, it can be anxiety inducing. If you're in the MR scanner for that long, it's an enclosed tube, people get claustrophobic. So can we actually increase the efficiency at how we gather the images in the first place? So instead of an MR protocol taking 30 or 40 minutes, can we reduce it to 15 or 20 minutes or even shorter to five minutes? So that's something that I'm particularly interested in is can we use some computer vision techniques, marry them with some of the physics of the medical imaging that we know to be able to get images more efficiently using machine learning? And then once we have these images, what can we do with it? Uh, can we build better classification models? Can we build better prognostication models? So really trying to go end to end from generating the images as well as analyzing the images, I feel like summarizes my research interests from a broad level. Yeah, yeah, this is definitely interesting. So like it's more along the intersection of acquisition and processing those images for better insights. So yeah, yeah, definitely. Absolutely. Yeah, at Stanford, we typically uh, call it upstream and downstream uh, image uh, acquisition and analysis. So upstream involves anything that leads to the generation of the image. And downstream is where you start with an image for any subsequent analysis. And I think right now, given our knowledge of computer vision, upstream and downstream are somewhat separate. But I really think in the future, it'll just be one end-to-end -end optimization where we start off with under sample data, uh, and then really end with clinical diagnoses instead of making arbitrary distinctions somewhere in the middle. Hmm. <laughs> interesting, interesting. So uh, be before we get, get deeper insight into the topic is uh, you have a strong educational background in bioengineering, as you said, and which is basically at the intersection of what it says itself, like a medical knowledge plus some somewhat along the lines of engineering. So how did you first of all discover uh, the application of machine learning in general and the possibilities with it? And how did you how did you discover it? And what did you do about it then? Yeah, that's a really good question. And I think bioengineering at the end of the day can be a really catch-all term and different bioengineering programs in the country can really focus on different areas of research. Uh, so for example, my undergrad institution was UC San Diego and over there, bioengineering really meant more mechanical engineering applied to biology. At some other universities, there might be more of a focus on electrical engineering principles applied to biology. Some schools have more CS and bioinformatics focused programs. So I think it's really hard to define what bioengineering means. It's very institutional specific. And I guess thinking back 
about my journey. Um, when I started off as an undergrad at UC San Diego, I thought I wanted to become an MD. Um, and I, start, I got involved with research because I'd heard that if you have research experience, it makes your uh, MD application a little bit more competitive. But I always had a pretty strong technical background and interest in math, science. Um, so I was always interested and excited to do research. But only after being involved in the research field for around a year or so did I realize, hey, this is really fun. Uh, there's a lot of open, unsolved problems in the world. And I liked applying my engineering principles uh, to be able to solve those problems. I'd done a couple of internships at a hospital in, in itself. And I guess I realized that I didn't really like being in a hospital. Um, I wanted to be able to help patients, but maybe I didn't have the emotional fortitude to be able to see sick people all the time and to be able to interact with them. So for me, I really figured that, hey, if I can be on the sidelines, if I can build new tools and build new technologies that can help those patients, I think that would be a win-win. And that's how I continued staying more in research as an undergrad and then realized, hey, um, there's still a lot more to be done. And that's kind of how my academic journey started. Wow, that's that's uh, that is one thing I would I would second definitely a lot. One of the reasons I didn't pursue medical, um, of course, it, it 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 has the same feeling for me that I wanted to be someone like an MD or doctor that is like actually who can uh, be on the medical aspect. But one thing I I just can, cannot handle, uh, I cannot handle. Like, I am not courageous enough to see sick patients, all those uh, dissections and all those whatever it whatever that stuff is called. But I'm I'm just scared of those things. So yeah, definitely. Yeah, but, I have a lot of friends who are MDs, and I think, especially nowadays with COVID, I, I feel like I respect them so much more just because there's so much emotional, has so many emotional challenges associated with dealing with patients, uh, especially if they might be dying because of things like COVID. And I don't think it would be possible for me to be able to leave that at work. I feel like that would, <laughs> that would affect my personal life quite a bit. So I'm very respectful and very glad. Uh, that there are people who choose to do that and um, they're very courageous. Right, right, right. And so trying to date back what you said is uh, you are trying to work at the intersection of image acquisition and applying machine learning to post-process these images. So what is one thing in your current experience that you feel ma machine learning or from the engineering aspect that is lacking that you see as a big research question? You said you know, there were many open questions. So what according mm -hmm. to you as of now in 2021, let's say, that you think machine learning could really do better that if if at all we I had this particular X application or if um, machine learning could do these things, things would be much more, a lot easier on the side of medical experts. Yeah, I, I think the answer might be a little bit, you know, what one would expect, but just being able to do more with less training data would be useful because my experience in healthcare has been that it's very easy to build a model that works maybe at one institution really well. But then within the healthcare spectrum, if you go to another institution, you know, there's quite a few features that can change. Uh, obviously, the patient demographics can be very different from one state to the other state, one country to another country. But at the same time, even if the demographics were identical, how we acquire the images changes too. So for example, if we're sticking on the theme of MRI scans, which is kind of where a lot of my expertise is, there's a few major vendors that produce these MRI scanners. And there's, you know, the, some of the main ones are GE, Philips, and Siemens. And if I ask some of my radiologist colleagues, if I got scanned, if I got a brain MRI scan on the same day on a GE scanner and a Philips scanner and a Siemens scanner, with all things equal, the radiologist that I work with, they'll be able to tell which scanner the images came from. Just because each one has a different sort of noise uh, characteristics, the blurring patterns are slightly different and radiologists can read through that. But if we're building computer vision-based algorithms, maybe we end up having spurious correlations because of these. Maybe we have limited generalizability from one scanner to the other scanner. So I think really trying to build data efficient tools so we don't need large data sets from each institution uh, to be able to build useful algorithms, I think is probably the biggest challenge. Um, and I think maybe even going beyond that, Right now, people tend to only focus on one type of modality at any given time. So maybe only working with imaging. 
uh, or some people work with radiology reports, which is an, a pure NLP uh, way of doing uh, research. But I feel like NLP is also mostly in the silo and some people work with electronic medical records, which can be a whole challenge in itself. But at the end of the day, all three of those really describe the patient and each adds a new uh, extent of information and something novel. So if we can build better models that take into account all these multimodality data sources, I think we can do a little bit better than what we can currently. Obviously there's a lot of overhead in getting that data and being able to use it efficiently. But I think slowly but surely that's where the field is going. So I'm um, just a follow-up question to that because this again comes from a, a personal experience of working with these different sources of data. Is do you do do you also see when you say these uh, these are challenges? Are these challenges after the thing that has been developed along the lines of image registration? For example, there are lots of tools which try to align to a template. Like for example, they try to do non-linear mm -hmm. registrations and all those things. So uh, when you say there are still challenges, are the, are you saying uh, after those? tools and approaches or is it something before that like just the raw images when you say there is a uh, heterogeneous uh, understanding of data uh, is it before the registration or registration can take care of that yeah i would say it's a little bit before in the image generation process too um, essentially if we're working with one specific mr vendor the images will have a particular look and feel to it uh, and what i've noticed what varies the most is blurring uh, even if we acquire the same acquisition with the same resolution, same signal to noise ratio, just the overall look and feel can be different. And it's those image level variations that will affect all your downstream applications. So for example, if you're trying to register a scan that a person had on an MR scanner one, uh, and then they got a follow-up scan on a second MR scanner, if they're different vendors, even though the underlying anatomy is the same, the way it's represented through the pixels is slightly different. So that variation will affect all your downstream analysis if you're building segmentation algorithms, classification, registration, anything at that point that relies on the pixel data as an input. Right, right, right. Yeah, yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, definitely. And uh, one thing also you mentioned well, that I want to pick on is multimodality of data that uh, a lot of people are trying to focus on right now. And again, that is one thing that even we as my, my pro research product that we are trying to incorporate. But one thing that I realize in m many of the journal papers is when we try to do this multimodal deep learning models, when we try to build these models, a thing that gets introduced and which is highly uh, debated i would say not researched as of now but which is the introduction of bias in the data so when i when i introduce these demographics data for example your age gender demographics and other other things there are there is a high chance that machine learning models can get biased based based on your for example the ethnicity or genders that is uh, specific to person so do you think that would be a, a problem from a medical standpoint? Because uh, machine learning models just treat everyone as just bits or binary values. They don't understand the differences between uh, biases. So do you think that is a problem? And if so, are there any ways that you have encountered which are trying to mitigate that? And if not, uh, is it an open research question still? Yeah, I think that's a pretty active area of research and there's probably too not too many like conclusive things that I can say, but if I had to go off and just comment a little bit, I think bias can be good and bad depending on how it's actually incorporated into the models. So for example, in machine learning, we talk about having inductive biases built into our models that can actually add new information to the priors that we're trying to build out. So for example, if we know, you know, a recent, maybe I'll give a, uh, example here, we were trying to work with some CT scans and a patient's medical record data to predict risk of cardiovascular disease. Uh, we built a few models that worked only on images and they worked pretty well. And then we built a few models that worked only on EMR data and those worked pretty well. Obviously the models that worked the best were that combined both of those because the imaging has particular signs or markers of future cardiovascular disease. But at the same time, so does your medical record. For example, if you're male, you have a higher chance of cardiovascular disease as a baseline. So right. if we actually add that as an inductive bias into our model, hopefully uh, we can try to better solve that problem. So in that case, adding some medical information uh, into what the model is using as a prior is beneficial. But I totally see the point that 
if we limit ourselves to small data sets that are not representative of where we would apply that uh, model to, then the biases are not helpful. In fact, they might hurt patient because you know, if our model is trained only on one ethnicity and then we apply it to a different ethnicity, that ethnicity may have different risk factors for disease, uh, different susceptibility factors. So I think at that point, that is an active area of research and hopefully maybe coming up with methods that are less intensive on the data needs may help generalize across demographics or across ethnicities, but I don't think that's necessarily been well studied and it needs to be because we are responsible for the patient's health uh, and how they progress in the future. So before we deploy any algorithm at a large scale, we need to be able to characterize the performance and we need to be able to characterize whether or not the behavior is really generalizable to the population that we expect to see at test time. Right, right. And I, I agree. And I guess this brings to the same bottleneck of uh, many of the deep learning models right now is to, like, when you, I, I love the statement that you said, like there are good biases and there are bad biases, because a lot of uh, a lot of predictive uh, classification happen happens based on those bias terms. But I guess this brings to the part that explainability and interpretability to understand what the model mm -hmm. is trying to learn like what part of bias is really helpful because i i guess gender would be an, a very good classification even for human experts or medical experts who are humans and yeah i guess this brings to again the same uh, uh bottleneck that uh, only if mm -hmm. these black box models wouldn't be black box things would be a lot more easier so yeah yeah definitely and yeah uh, i think interpretability Oh, go ahead. Sorry, 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 sorry. Yeah, go ahead. Oh, I was just going to say, I think interpret, inter interpretability, sorry, excuse me, um, is this, I think that's a very active area of research, being able to understand uh, why models make a certain prediction, trying to understand, are there any causal mechanisms or is our model making a prediction based on some spurious correlations? How can we actually decouple those effects? I feel like that is a very active area of research and something that we're investigating. Can we go beyond typical feature attribution methods like grad cam analysis? Uh, because it's always nice to show one or two images in a paper, but it's much harder to really understand, well, if I had this for every single patient that came into a hospital, how would the radiologist actually use that information? Is that information useful in the first place or is it also systematically biased in how, let's say the grad cam output is produced? So. Lots of um, exciting research to be done there, I think. Yeah, yeah. Um, while we are on that topic, uh, I don't know if I, I had that pl uh, planned already to ask you, but while we are on that topic, like I want, I also want to understand is what exactly, because like you said, interpretability is much more of a subjective term. It really differs from application to application, data sets to data sets and uh, model to model. So in terms of when, you, when we are dealing with neuroimaging data, what kind of, and, and, and of course, uh, a lot of other data for it, it's a multimodal model. So how in terms of, medical expert standpoint, would you like to see? Let's say you have a magic wand that you can say that I just want this to be solved. What would an end result look like for you if, if you wanted um, interpretability for a deep, deep multimodal model? And uh, just, just before like clarification would be like, uh, like uh, there is a subtle distinction between explainability and interpretability. Interpretability mm -hmm. is making the model more interpretable and explainability would be like explaining just one particular prediction saying like this person would have cancer, why? So what are your thoughts on that? Like how would you like to see if something was just like a magic wand for you? Yeah, I think I if I could pick and choose, I would love my models to be more interpretable. So let's say if we go back to the situation where we've collected some data from one particular institution, um, let's say we're only working with neuroimaging data um, and there is maybe some, there's a wide distribution of what sort of ethnicities or what sort of demographics are in my training data set. Really understanding the importance of each training data point and how that training data point is being represented by my model. Is it being, if I only have, let's say one unique example of one particular ethnicity, is it being filtered out as noise or is there a large weighting being given on that? I feel like being able to interpret and ping the model behavior about what is the representation that we're creating, um, I think that would be great. Um, and I think a lot of research items on my wish list are, can we better understand what sort of representations are created by models? Because I think that can help us better understand 
future data needs too. If I know that my model works really well for a particular type of classification, then I won't worry about getting more data or getting more labels. And then at that point, I'd focus on getting something else or maybe trying to focus on a different disease or a different type of patients. So at the end of the day, understanding the value of each data point and being able to really interpret that would be, you know, if you could give me a birthday gift, uh, I would love that. <laughs> yeah, yeah, I guess that, that makes sense. Like trying to understand which particular features are contributing by what uh, magnitude uh, for that particular uh, patient would be definitely uh, helpful to medical experts. Mm -hmm. But yeah. And uh, the one other question along those lines would be uh, how, like when we, when we say uh, AI is being used in medi uh, medical domains, how exactly th that adoption looks like in the pure medical research? Is it a part of a tool to better organize and work with data? Or is it something that is trying to change uh, the way pure medical research is being done right now? So because I'm, I'm, I'm asking you that question is because you, you are much more at a better intersection than many others that I have uh, interviewed is uh, you're really working at the intersection. You are dealing with a lot of uh, pure medical experts versus you are also trying to yourself delve into the uh, research of machine learning. So how exactly that adoption is being done and what could be the what could be the future case of that particular adoption? Yeah, I think that's a really good question. Uh, what I think is that at the end of the day, machine learning, it's just a tool. Uh, it's another <laughs> tool like other tools that we've always been able to use. And what's used to answer our questions um, and what should define a lot of the research. And I think what does define a lot of research nowadays is still some clinical significance. So, you know, we were talking about some of the ADME data sets that you're working with earlier today. Well, the reason we're collecting that data and working with it is we want to better understand what causes Alzheimer's, are there early biomarkers? So I feel like having a very specific question that we can work with and then using machine learning as a tool to answer that question is probably the best way to approach research in general. And I think that is what will be successful because there's so many machine learning algorithms that are built papers that are published. And then it never really goes into a clinical production because A, you may have built a problem to solve something that wasn't a problem uh, clinically, or maybe you built a model that doesn't really work well clinically. And at that point, how do we characterize how good model performance has to be? So I think everything has to be top down where everything comes in from a clinical perspective and at the same time, we can build new machine learning tools to help answer those questions. So I think that's that's really been my perspective on a lot of the successful research that I see and research going forward to uh, answer questions that are worth answering because you can come up with a lot of arbitrary questions. Uh, and even if you answer them, there may or may not be of value at the end of the day. Right. Yeah. Th yeah. That totally makes sense. Like it, it's more like machine learning is trying to better complement the medical research that is trying to make hypotheses that are new hypotheses that might not be solved using traditional uh, knowledge. Or uh, uh, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah I, I can hear. Uh, oh, okay. sorry. I, I thought I lost you for a second. Sorry, Frank. But yeah, no. yeah, yeah. That totally makes sense. Yeah. And, um, yeah, I mean, and I, I definitely I, imagine that there's some new questions that machine learning can just help us answer and just enable completely new paradigms of question asking. But I would say those are few and far between compared to some of the questions that we can ask today. But I think there needs to be a healthy mix because if you only do applied research, you'll never come up with new basic technologies, new basic science to answer questions that you'll come up with tomorrow. So it's a little bit of a give and take uh, and it also depends on where you are in the spectrum. So for example, I work in a radiology department and my department's in the School of Medicine. So I am obviously biased by all the medical specific uh, problems and the medical information, but perhaps if someone is working in a CS department, they're more interested uh, in building new methods. And once you build a successful new method, you'll find applications that are useful. So I think it's just different perspectives, but since, Machine learning in healthcare is a little bit more nascent right now. The more successful use cases, um, they've had a clinical question and a clinical adopter uh, who's typically a clinician or an MD who's willing to use that method in day-to-day -day practice. 
yeah 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 definitely i totally agree it's it's much more on the uh, like understanding what each of these uh, sciences can offer it's much more like uh, mm-hmm. understanding what we want from medical standpoint versus there are limitations what machine learning can do and it has its own uh, advantages and disadvantages so it has to be yeah interdisciplinary where well, definitely i totally agree to that and right. um w- one of the other things that uh, you did mention uh, in one of the other answers was uh, dealing with small data sets so we, that is one of the most like i guess any person who is trying to develop into machine learning plus um, medical imaging domain the first uh, roadblock that he, he or she has is small data sets and that is much yeah. more um, much more of a shocker because when i when i when as a grad student when i used to have these models and course assignments we are, we assume that there are images and they are in millions or maybe in 10000s or maybe in 50000s so we understand and when when when, when i'm dealing with data sets now where i took like i guess it took me 2 months to get data set of a sample size 45 patients which was from mayo clinic and uh, the collaborator said that's done and i was like uh, i'll be like 45 images is like nothing it has nothing to crunch on so but there are a few methods from pure medical computer uh, from pure computer science research that have been proposed to deal with small data sets like uh, transfer learning few shot learning uh, and zero shot learning but in uh, like in your breadth of research that you would have done and trying to understand these approaches do you think they have a shot at trying to solve medical imaging problems that are right now for example uh, you work with a lot of processing uh, tasks do you think these methods have a future and if not what, what uh, like can we use those tools in medical imaging uh, contexts Absolutely and I think over there what becomes important is defining a good clinical use case. So let's say if you're working with your 45 sample data set and that the machine learning tool that you're building is trying to augment something that a radiologist does or maybe something that a clinician does just knowing what sort of accuracy is expected uh is useful because we can always build better machine learning algorithms to work with smaller data sets. but if we never know how good an algorithm has to be to be clinically good enough we we'll, we can always just keep iterating so i think it has to be a loop between the clinician and as well as the technology developer to come up with some at least minimum bar for calibrating your model performance and then some of the questions are more on the technical side you mentioned you know some meta learning approaches to do few shot or zero shot learning i think those are pretty promising and they've been applied in a lot of medical imaging tasks recently something that we're focusing on too is this notion of self supervised learning which i think works pretty well in the context of medical imaging because we have a lot of imaging data from the past if we just look into archives there's thousands of patients but for those thousands of patients we may not have any clinically meaningful labels to train against but can we still leverage those images and try to use newer ways of training that works to build good representations using that unlabeled data and then fine tune uh, with some label data sets i think that is a pretty promising area of research but again to answer whether or not that will make a difference clinically will depend on what question that you're trying to answer maybe if you're solving a segmentation problem and you're looking at lung nodules from ct scans that are really small well you probably need very high segmentation accuracy for that but let's say if you're trying to diagnose uh, i don't know covid ground glass opacities from ct scans uh, debatable use case but maybe even if you have a low accuracy segmentation algorithm the clinical utility that you get from it will still be just fine so having a honest conversation with a clinician to better understand why you're solving that problem and how good do you have to be should be i think step number 1 before you embark on any project even and then as a technical developer that will give you a lot of insight on how good does your algorithm have to be before it can make a clinical impact yeah, hopefully yeah, that yeah. answered your question Yeah yeah it definitely does and i i really like the idea of having a dialogue between these two uh, uh disciplines it helps the person uh understand what approach uh might be the best because there is definitely not one approach that solves all the problems each of these algorithms in machine learning are good on its own data sets and trying to mm-hmm. map each of these applications to these algorithms could only be solved using that dialogue so i definitely understand that and But, the additional point i'd like to add over there is 
in medical imaging, like you mentioned, we sometimes deal with smaller data sets, but I try to view that as a good thing instead of a bad thing. Maybe that helps me sleep better at night. But if we build a model and it doesn't work, well, if we have a small data set, uh, maybe there's something fundamentally wrong about the data that we're feeding into our models and the models are just fine. So we can just acquire some new data uh, for like 10 or 20 subjects or 10 or 20 patients and start that process over. So I think on one end, you can't necessarily just rely on building a large model and then training it indefinitely on a thousand TPUs. <laughs> but if there's any problems with your data set, you have the flexibility and the freedom to rethink what is the input to your model. Uh, we don't have to be constrained by just ImageNet. We don't have to be constrained by CIFAR. Our domain for the inputs can be flexible. Uh, so I really like having that flexibility where not only can we tune our models and build new models, but we can really think about what is the best input to help answer the clinical questions that we work with. Hmm, yeah, yeah, I, I really like that approach because it tries to defies you to much more innovative solutions rather than just uh, trying to stitch what is already out there. So I, I really like that approach. Like you're, you're much more of a, a like a bottom to top kind of a researcher. So that's like trying to start with what we have and let's see if I can do it. But if I cannot, I'll try to develop my own solution. So I, I yeah, definitely that defines much more of a researcher motivation inside you. But and I, I think it's helpful to be in, embedded in a medical school where we have the ability to acquire that data and to have the ability to have the conversations with the clinicians to enable that process. So I think that's why collaborations between technical and clinical folks, I think, are key to making a real impact. Right, right. And uh, we, we, we talked a lot about the medical, um, uh, medical aspect of machine learning, but trying to deviate more on the technical because a lot of people who watch these or listen to these podcasts are people who are interested in machine learning more than the other aspects so it's more more like machine learning plus some application mm -hmm. so if, if i were to probe you more on the implementation levels because when we talk about uh, implementing machine learning models they sound very smooth enough but they are often not when we actually mm -hmm. try to deploy these models work with these models and mm -hmm. even tweaking those parameters could uh, often be a very uh, hard issue so how did you particularly learn about the, when, when you figured out a machine learning is something that has a strong promise for uh, your particular research interest, how did you go on to learning and mastering the skills that are required accordingly? And what were some of the best practices that worked out for you? Was it courses, internships? You said you interned at a lot of hospitals where you might be working on that intersection uh, stage. So what were some of the best techniques that helped you learn these skills the best manner? And what are what are some of the practices that still work for you? If you, if when you say you, you want to uh, try zero shot learning, it's not something you're just like, uh, uh, moving folder from one place to another. Mm -hmm. So what works for you right now too? Yeah, I, I've i actually never taken a formal course in machine learning in my life. Uh, <laughs> I, I, I think back in like 2015 or 2016, I had the option of taking a Stanford CS course uh, on computer vision, but I think I was too lazy to go to the class. So I would just watch the videos uh, from my dorm room. But I, I think that really symbolizes how I've learned a lot of machine learning is I think ML is a very unique field where there's so much information available online. Now, some good, some bad, but I think just it's available online. You know, uh, I learned by watching a lot of YouTube videos and then reading a lot of papers. At first, reading core ML papers was tough, uh, especially papers from NeurIPS or you know, ICML, for example, that had a lot of theory but I just forced myself to read them and try to understand them as much as possible and try to think of a clinical question that I could apply some of these methods to. And for me, I don't really think it's that important to implement the most exotic method or the like fanciest method. In fact, I always shy away from that. And that's something I tell my students whenever they're trying something, start with the simplest method that you can imagine. Um, a lot of times probably like the logistic regression will probably work much better than a lot of uh, complicated CNN models. But can we really simplify the problem uh, when we're starting off with it? Um, and then really understand the pros and cons of spending more time on different aspects of it. So maybe you can spend 50 hours on coming up with a new model architecture. Well, what are the potential benefits that you might get from that within the context of the problem that you're trying to solve? 
in some cases it might be worth it, but in some other cases, maybe just working on a data pre-processing scheme might be a little bit better. So I think that that just took a lot of trial and error. And sometimes you have to do things to really understand and get an intuition as to why things work. But that was my path, you know, watching YouTube videos, reading papers that are posted on archive and trying to implement some of the ones that were a little bit more promising. Yeah, that, that sounds very interesting because you, it seems like you much more, you are much more of a self-taught person which uh, which learned along the way. Like if, if there was a block in front of you, you tried to do your homework or whatever research that needs to be done and then you learned those skills using the resources at your disposal. So yeah, definitely that that, that really helps. And, and, I, and I would be remiss to not point out, uh, point out the fact that, you know, since you brought up this notion of resources, the best resources at the end of the day are the people that are around you. So when I was learning, we would always have journal clubs with other PhD students that wanted to learn machine learning. Some were experts, some were beginners. So being able to just ask a question to a group and get people's feedback on it, I thought was very useful too. And we're all learning more or less in the same manner. And I found that having that community uh, really helped solve a lot of the problems that I had. And all of, I think having that community helped all of us get better uh, over time. Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I totally uh, second that. And just a one liner on that is like when I when I joined over here as a master's student, I always used to see these groups and they were so much intimidating when I joined over there because I was a very, very naive person who didn't have much hands into the research. But right now, when, when I'm a part of these groups, these groups help you a lot trying to browse through this research because it could be a lot of work when you try to read all potential papers in computer vision, something mm -hmm. like computer vision, yeah. which is like one of the most mature fields in machine learning. And there are tons of papers coming out. So I, I definitely I definitely second that. Uh, and, and, and I guess there are many on online journal clubs to where people post out their understandings of the paper so yeah those those are a few of the best resources that i uh, i have uh, browsed on, on internet too but yeah um, and i think using those resources sometimes i i think at the end of the day you still have to do something to really learn it it's kind of like doing homework too uh you can read the textbook you can watch the lectures at least for me if i don't actually sit down and write out the math or do the derivations, I won't really understand it. So you can read all you want. Uh, you can watch as many videos as you want, but making sure that you can actually have some small data sets. It doesn't matter if you have a GPU or a CPU, do something uh, and get some errors and try to debug through those errors. I feel like that's where the learning process is. Um, and I feel like that that is what helped me the most is some of those problems that I faced trying to implement these methods. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> again, uh, I love to talk on this topic. And just one pointer again on this topic is uh, when, when I joined over here at Greg Red course, that was one course that we had as an assignment trying to do back propagation by hand. So that mm -hmm. was one thing I never did. And I never considered doing it. It was like, okay, I understood what back propagation is. It is just mm -hmm. like a gradient where you take on and it tries to trace back to the weight values. But over there, when I did that, I actually understood you know, what are the what are the complications of yeah. back propagation, and I was like, wow! Now actually, I can say that I understand what uh, a forward pass and a backward pass is. Mm -hmm. Before that, it was just a person from a Python level or maybe just a TensorFlow level that I understood what back. So I, I definitely uh, uh, second on that. That yeah, implementation is if you implement it only once, that that concept remains live for uh, yeah. forever. So yeah. Yeah, I fully agree on that. I still remember one of the homework assignments for my uh, deep learning class that I never took, but I just watched the lectures, was implementing a neural network uh, from scratch in NumPy, doing the forward and backward passes. And I'm glad I did it once. Um, <laughs> it, was, it was a beneficial experience, but I think it, it really helped solidify my understanding of what is happening. And then even when you move on to like your TensorFlows and your PyTorch, knowing what's going on, um, at the bare bones level will help you optimize and try to understand and how to narrow down the solution space that you can look through to build a better model at the end of the day. Yeah, yeah, definitely agree to that. 
and and trying to understand your uh, we, we did talk about your resources and the way you uh, gained those skills and how uh, implementation helped you but trying to understand your career role as uh, uh, building you a, a very successful researchers how did, can you speak to more on that as like how why did you decide to do a phd in the first place when you understood your interest was in uh, machine learning and uh, medical imaging and why not take up a job and uh, a, again a follow up question to that would be and uh, again one of the few people that uh, i have uh, interviewed on these particular channel is why did you go for a professor job after yeah. your phd and not an industrial job so uh, i uh, the uh, context of that answer would be like yeah. uh, how that how those roles have contributed to your interest in machine learning and how they have done a good or a bad job at making you a better person of whatever you are doing it yeah i feel like i'm very early on in my career so uh <laughs> some of these answers may change but yeah maybe if we start at the beginning uh trying to talk about why i went into getting a phd in the first place uh when i was an undergrad i mentioned that i'd done a couple of internships um and during those internships i saw other people who would get you know full time roles right after their undergrad and for me i did not necessarily find those jobs very intellectually stimulating uh and at least what i saw it was it was in the biotech field that the people who were asking some of the questions were people who were mostly coming in with phd's so i naively thought that maybe to have more of an impact getting a phd would be the solution so with that i i actually didn't even think about it for more than a couple of weeks and i was like yeah yeah phd seems right and i think i just got lucky that um i ended up in a successful program where i was surrounded by everyone who was smarter than me uh, and <laughs> i was able to use that uh to hopefully become a better researcher and to be able to learn new concepts and maybe think about why i decided to stay in academia it was a pretty tough decision initially uh when i was finishing up my phd i really wanted to understand what life is like on the other side you know what does <laughs> a industry lab look like so i tried doing a little bit of consulting for a few startups around here and a few startups internationally just to see how the process is different and for me i think being in a company versus being uh in academics was i think slightly the the philosophical constraints were slightly different uh, i even if i worked in industry i would like to work on building a product um as opposed to a core research lab but sometimes when you're trying to build products you know the goal of a company is to be able to sell things so i think you're a little bit more constrained by that cycle and it it wasn't for me uh from a full time perspective i liked being able to set my own research agenda if i found an interesting paper if i found an interesting observation in my data i wanted to have the flexibility to explore that more if i chose to and i think that really helped kind of point me towards staying in academics more and then i again got lucky uh staying at stanford because i'm just surrounded by people who are really fun um faculty as well as students because everyone works hard at the end of the day but everyone is just fun to work with um a lot of my colleagues are really good friends and i didn't want to say bye to those people so i figured i would stick around and the, i think the rest is history the at the end of the day we're trying to solve interesting problems and i get to work with fun motivated people so i don't think i can have it any better yeah definitely i definitely agree to some of the points you definitely made although i'm not sure if i would be going to the academia for my uh, full time positions i'm not very sure of that but uh, i definitely understand those motivations for phd and your inclinations toward research but um uh one other other question that i normally ask and along the lines of resources is just one last question it would be is uh for you I, it would be much more specific to if p young medical researchers who are trying to learn and uh, who, who are trying to discover machine learning and trying to make an understanding of how to go forward and the reason i ask this question is uh, once you discover machine learning and the applications of it unless you are in a very good grad course uh, enrolled as a in a good grad course the information available online is too much massive and overwhelming it's like you might see papers and all those things but implementation is much more hard to grasp and unless you have a very good advisor who teaches you like okay this is step 1 step 2 step 
then you can get easily demotivated uh, at the very same end that you get motivated so for medical people who who might not be concerned with the pure medical of uh, pure computer science research how would you advise them to get started once they understand the importance of machine learning and how can they really move forward with that exploration yeah i think this advice would probably stay true for starting any new project regardless of what your background is but really doing a thorough literature review to see what is the current state of knowledge that the field has uh, maybe I'll pick pick an arbitrary problem. Like, let's say we're trying to diagnose COVID from chest X-rays. Everyone seems to be doing that nowadays. Um, if that is a project that I want to work on tomorrow, well, the first thing I would do today is try to see where is the field at? What is the pressing clinical question that we need to answer? What are some of the best techniques that work for that data set? Uh, what are some of the gotchas that you might have? So really trying to get a full breadth of information. I mean, obviously it's impossible to get a full breadth, but trying to add as much info to that. And then hopefully start trying to find places that haven't been explored. So maybe people haven't looked at the generalizability across different institutions. Okay, that is one potential project I could work on. Uh, another project could be, well, there's just not enough data sets and our classification models suffer. Well, okay, maybe some meta-learning or some few-shot learning approaches could be useful there. So trying to build a map of where the field is, and then just, I like writing down all the different questions that you could ask and all the different areas you could work in. And then I always try to think why I shouldn't work on a problem before working on it, to try to make sure that, you know, if other people have considered it or if there's any results published already, then maybe it's not such a big research area. And after the whole analysis, if I haven't crossed off my problem, then it's probably worthwhile to work on. Right. That's at least my mind map for approaching new projects. Yeah, yeah, this is this is inspiring. I'm, I'm, I mean, I'll, I'll definitely take an inspiration from this. It's it it's it's, it's definitely much more organized than the way I approach a, a particular problem. So yeah, I'll I'll definitely take some citation to that. Yeah. So uh, yeah, yeah the, the downside of that method is um, I have a lot of research questions that I come up with, <laughs> and they just keep getting put on a to do list, and they never actually get answered. So I think I I need to learn a balance too. Yeah, 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 definitely. I mean, uh, this is something like the board that I have. I don't know if that's visible, I but uh, it's like I used to. So one thing that I came up with is I, I got few colored markers and every question or every topic, I would say rather, uh, one one specific topic I would read up. And if the, it is very interesting to me and in, in, in some ways, if it tries to ma marry my uh, PhD thesis later on, I would write it down. And what happened over the last, I guess, what, uh, maybe nine months is I have a list of topics over there, but it's just in my subconscious that it's going to be there. Let's just focus on my today's work. So it's like, it always remains on the to-do. I don't know if I would be ever reading them again. So. Yeah. Sometimes it's like the local versus global perspective, right? On a day-to-day -day <laughs> perspective, it's hard to switch projects, but sometimes, sometimes I will just try to take a day off off just to think about projects and to think about future directions and what I actually find pretty helpful for defining my projects is whenever I come up with an idea I also try to score it so what is the impact if, if successful uh, what is the impact that idea would have on a scale of one to ten how long I think working on it would be, uh, would take what is the novelty uh, I think I use one more metric, I forget. Um, and, and how much excitement? Uh, because sometimes you can work on problems that can be really impactful, but maybe it's not exciting for you. So I try to score things as much as possible so that if and when in the future I get time to work on these projects, not that I will, at least I'll have a better quantitative metric of figuring out which project to spend more time on. <laughs> yeah, definitely. I'm, I'm I'm going to make a note of this one because this is this is really helpful to me personally. I don't know about the other people listening to this podcast, but <laughs> the organizing thoughts is uh, a never-ending task for me. So yeah, definitely. Yeah. Yeah, and if you come up with a good solution, please let me know. Uh, I think <laughs> organization is only the first process. Uh, working on the ideas is a whole complete new game, which I'm very bad at. <laughs> yeah, definitely, definitely. And um, trying to, uh, I know I might be jumping topics, is, but uh, if we were to jump back to your current work, 
what is one thing that you are currently working on regardless of whatever the uh, success rate is or whatever your stage of implementation level is what is one thing that is taking up most of your uh, research quota in your brain that is you're really excited about and you're trying out maybe it could be a discovery or like like just trying to discover what it can do or exploration but what is one thing ml technique that you are trying your hands on with right now yeah, so uh, I think this kind of combines some of my research research interests that I've had in the past, and it's really trying to go faster in terms of generating MRI uh, MRI data. So, like I mentioned, sometimes generating these images can take anywhere from like twenty to forty minutes of time. That's because fundamentally, to build an image, we need to sample some raw data, um, and we need to sample at a specific rate. You know, in MRI, it's called the Nyquist frequency. And if we sample at a frequency less than that, we're going to have some sort of artifacts in the image and it won't be of diagnostic image quality. One of the problems that I'm really interested in is, well, how can we overcome the Ny Nyquist criteria with novel signal processing techniques? And can we combine what we know about signal processing? Can we combine that with the physics of the medical imaging systems that we work with and combine that with some of the computer visions that we work, uh, computer vision methods we work with? So trying to come up with a unified approach of using all of those elements to be able to scan faster uh, is something that I'm excited about because you know, at least in countries like the US, we have access to a lot of MRI scanners, uh, which means that if people need the imaging technique, they can probably get an MRI scan done sooner rather than later. But since these scanners are so expensive uh, to install and maintain, the whole world doesn't necessarily have access to those. So instead of being able to scan 20 patients per day, if we can scan 40 patients per day, I think that can be just beneficial to health in general, especially outside of developed countries. So I think that is something that excites me is how can we get diagnostic information from less time and add more value to how we do radiology? And then that's kind of like the clinical question but there's a lot of different approaches that we can use to answer that question. We can use some supervised learning techniques and recently we're exploring some fully unsupervised methods where we just need no training data to be able to solve the same problem. And what we're trying to do right now is understanding the pros and cons of these different methods. So that's exciting. Uh, and I hope to continue working on that. Yeah, yeah, definitely. And, and one other quick clickbaity question that I normally tend to ask and, and trying to like, it's much more of a clarification. I, I, I knowing what machine learning actually is and what, how it operates, a lot of hype that goes on in media articles and those one line uh, headlines is, uh, is radiology going to be automated? Or is it something that, and, and, and this question goes to be on a much more, uh, uh, broader sense is like AI is going to uh, bring an automation into the medical domains, I would say, because I'm, I'm not trying to be specific to any kind of uh, data sets over here. So I know automation is not really possible, but a lot of things people didn't know that might be automated are now automated. So for example, for self self driving domain, like there are there are definitely barriers to making us fully photo uh, fully autonomous uh, driving but definitely people are trying to do that and they have a fair amount of success do you think um, you did answer that it's always going to be a clinical plus medical imaging uh, i would say block so first approach would be always clinical but do you see certain certain techniques that are being done by human supervision that might be automated using some of the techniques for example that you are working on that you're trying to build a pipeline which is like basically trying to synchronize stuff for example image registration i i learned this thing uh, to, to put more context into this question is i learned this thing that image registration even if you use these tools you have to verify each of these images because the person might be tilted like the head position of the person might be tilted and blah blah so that is not one automated solution you cannot just use one script but do you still think that ai could do things that might be into the automation pipeline that right now is not but in next five or ten years are, are you seeing those algorithms getting mature enough to bring some level of automation to the current medical procedures yeah and then maybe i'll kind of defer to my usual answer uh, which is it really depends on the clinical use case and instead of trying to think about machine learning from an automation perspective for ra radiology 
I really try to think of it from an augmentation perspective because there are certain tasks that our radiologists have to do that are pretty easy to do, but are time consuming. So maybe one example is, let's say if you're getting a CT scan of your chest and you're trying to look at different nodules that you may have that might be indicative of lung cancer. Well, the way we do a lot of things clinically is the radiologist has to sift through and draw all those nodules and basically compare those nodules longitudinally. So if I come in for a CT scan today, and if I come in for a CT scan five years from now, I have to see, well, the nodule was in this, that was in the same place, how did it change over time? And to do that, you still have to do the manual annotation. You have to say, oh, this was X centimeters big at 10.1, and then Y centimeters big at 10.2, and make some, uh, inf make some diagnostic decision based on that. So that process, I think, could be augmented where some deep learning based systems can help with the segmentation and generate those morphology metrics and then provide those directly to the clinician. And now the clinician has a little bit more time that they're not spending drawing these circles, but maybe they can look into the patient's medical record, read their medical history a little bit more because a patient is more than just the image. Uh, in order to be able to render a diagnosis, you need to know what are the symptoms of the patients, what are the past priors. But sometimes our clinicians can be so busy that they may not have as much time as they need to look into that background. So if you can automate some of these boring but easy tasks, I think that will free up a lot of the clinician time to spend more time per patient and try to dig a little bit deeper. And I think there's a lot of domains where you do need to aggregate this information from multiple different fields. For example, pathology is very complicated because sometimes you might have like a whole slide image about the pathology. You might have some medical imaging. You ha might have some genomic analysis. You have the patient's medical record. That's just so much information for one person to sift through. So, if you're trying to get through like 10 or 15 patients per day, even if any mundane part of that can be automated and allow you to pay more attention to the patient from a holistic perspective, I think that will that is how machine learning will help our clinicians is doing the easy stuff so our human expertise can be saved for the harder stuff. Right. So yeah, in, in other words, it would be more like... Um trying to use machine learning for the redundant tasks where human errors could be a part of the process. So it's like trying to eliminate those and only focus uh, the medical expertise on decision making. So when you are trying to decide new or novel stuff, that could be much more uh, relevant. So yeah, 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 that totally makes sense. And yeah, uh, this brings me to just the last question. And I know, again, this question is definitely unmarried to the topics of medical mm -hmm. expertise or your technical expertise but i like to ask this question and, and uh, fortunately we did touch this particular question a few times during this particular podcast but i still want to ask is what really matters to you in terms of the work that you do like why do you why do you like doing it and what really matters that at least that you say to yourself that this is why I I think uh, I took up my professor job. I This is why I'm really interested to uh, get into my desk and work on those to-dos if you like you have those long to-dos. So uh, what really matters to you the most about your work and why does it matter? Yeah, for me, I think that's the simplest question to answer. And I think at the end <laughs> of the day, I want to be able to improve lives. Um, I think healthcare in general, you see so many diseases, you see so many maladies, you see so many people suffering. If there's any potential that, you know, a new method that we build even beyond machine learning can be used to help someone in need, maybe it'll help them live a little bit longer. Maybe it'll help them live a life with a little bit less pain. I feel like that has a very direct impact in people's lives. And I think working in a medical school, that's exactly what I want to at the end of the day is people's lives improving. So that motivates me when there's some challenging days, if there's some, you know, whenever you get bad news, you cannot really think why you're doing this. And we do this to improve people's lives. Um, and for me, that's a big motivational factor. Um, and that's why I decided to get into research in the first place. And I think that is what keeps me in research. 
that that's really motivating yeah definitely i'll again i'll second few of those points that definitely uh, motivates me about the machine learning aspect of this so yeah that's that's really interesting to know but um yeah thanks for sharing that and yeah this brings yeah. to the end of the podcast these are all the questions that i had particularly for you um uh, i'll definitely uh, i definitely have a few pointers for myself i don't know about the listeners but i definitely have few pointers because again i have been uh, fortunate to only interview few people who are working at the intersection of uh, medical imaging to be specific to you and plus machine learning so definitely i'll be much more in touch with you i'll be trying to follow you more on, on your research work so definitely and really thanks for being here and sharing your insights i hope uh, this is useful to people listening to this podcast too yeah it was super fun thank you for having me here and thank you for asking some really insightful questions um, i really enjoyed thinking about the questions that you asked and sometimes just saying things out loud you know like why are you doing research in the first place it's nice to i think hear that and think about it to really motivate you for a long time so i was very excited to do the interview and i'm always happy to answer more questions you know feel free to contact me via email twitter whatever pick your favorite platform and i'll be happy to try to help all right, all right. thank you thank you very much